And I would invite you this morning to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 as we continue our series. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, this morning's sermon is going to be a little shorter uh, because I only want to talk about one thing from the passage. Uh, it's something that really struck me. It's something I've been carrying around in my heart uh, for the last couple of weeks. And that is, what does church authority feel like? How should it feel when the pastor and the elders bring Jesus to you? Especially when it's a situation where maybe we're telling you in Jesus' name that something's gone wrong. What does pastoral ministry feel like then? And then related to that, what does congregational ministry feel like? How should it look? How should it feel when we bring Jesus to each other and to the world? What I think you'll see quite clearly this morning and what we're going to drill down on is that Paul is very concerned that the felt impact of his ministry uh, look like Jesus. He really wants his ministry to feel like the meekness and gentleness of Christ. And that's all I want to talk about this morning. How do we minister in a way that feels like the gentleness and meekness of Jesus? So let's read 2 Corinthians 10. It's only 18 verses. Uh, and then we'll look at uh, three things related to how ministry should feel uh, Christian ministry feels weaker than it should. The nature of Christian authority is meekness and gentleness. And then finally, is this us? Which is not meant to be a play on a TV show, but I realize that it could have been the, uh, that way. So I'm, I'll pretend like I'm more clever than I am. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's hear now God's word. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want you to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Thus far the reading of God's own word. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word which we know is a light to our feet, a lamp to our path. We know that it is the thing that creates life where there is no life, that raises the dead, and that sustains uh, our relationship with you. Father, we therefore pray that your spirit would go now forth with your word to give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to believe it. 
Father, we pray that the words of my mouth as your preacher and that the meditation of all of our hearts as those called to hear and respond to your word that would all now be pleasing in your sight. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So the thing that started me down this path of what Christian ministry should feel like was thinking about the criticisms Paul addresses in verses 8 through 10. Uh, in verse 8, Paul says he's not ashamed if he boasted a little too much about his authority in Jesus. And that's important. Paul doesn't shy away from the fact that he has authority. Apparently, he talked about his authority often enough that he's willing to say, maybe I talked about it a little too much, but I'm not ashamed if I did. Because, he says, my authority is for building you up. Paul said, Jesus has given me this authority as an apostle and a pastor and an elder to help you. And by the way, Paul is all of those things. He's called an elder in Ephesians. He's called a pastor in Timothy. And in every one of his letters, he's called an apostle. And Paul says, the authority Jesus has given me is for helping you receive the love and grace of Jesus through faith in the gospel. And then it's for helping you express, show, give that same love and grace to everyone around you in Jesus' name by faith in the gospel. It's for building you up into the temple of Jesus. So I'm thinking about Paul's authority. I'm thinking about what it means. And then I start thinking about, well, what did it look like when he exercised this authority in person with the people he was around? And I realized that, uh, especially after Paul says, maybe I talked about my authority a little too much, that in my head, I see Paul and saw Paul as a warrior and a fighter. Uh, my mind's eye pictured him as someone who would uh, shout down or could shout down his opponents with verbal aggression. Someone who, when he's in a room with his opponents, would make himself look bigger, take up space like someone trying to intimidate another fighter. Uh, I saw someone who used his massive intellect and incredible verbal skills, which Paul very clearly had, to buffalo people into agreeing with him, into doing what he said. Uh, frankly, I imagine Paul to be what we might char charitably describe as strong, but probably more accurately would describe as domineering. And I probably saw Paul this way, and by the way, I'm not alone. If you look at like Ancient artwork, Paul is usually pretty strong. If you look at children's Bibles, when they paint pictures or draw pictures of Paul, a lot of them, he has muscles on muscles. So, like, I probably view Paul this way, and lots of people probably view Paul this way, because this is how authority and power are so often used in our world. And not just politically, which is probably where our minds went to immediately, because that's where authority is most often considered. Family members will use authority this way. Church leaders can be domineering in the way they use their power. This just seems to be the way the world works, right? Authority and power tend to go together in a domineering and intimidating sort of way. And I saw Paul in my mind's eye preaching and teaching the same way, thundering forth from a pulpit uh, the way that I sort of imagine Spurgeon did occasionally. But then I reread verses 9 through 10. And Paul here says, I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. And you can hear the criticism that these people are making, people will, who Paul will call the super apostles in chapter 11. Uh, their point is, Paul writes these really strong really powerful, really authoritative letters. But then when he gets here and he talks to us face to face, he's pretty weak. He doesn't do any of the things that we would expect authoritative people to do. He doesn't get bigger. He doesn't drive us into the ground with his massive brain. And his speech is of no account. And what that means is he doesn't use the public speaking techniques of the politically and socially powerful, the way to show that you have the authority that you said that you had. Instead, he talks to us normally, 
Jesus plainly, honestly, gently, and oddly for someone with authority with begging and pleading. Paul literally says in verse 2, I beg of you. And so Paul's critics say, look, Paul writes a big game. He talks like he's strong and powerful. But when he gets in front of you, he isn't as big and strong as you think he should be. And that should tell you that maybe Paul doesn't really believe the things that he's saying. Or maybe that he doesn't really have the authority from Jesus that he says he does. Because if he did, if he had the authority of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, don't you think there would be more authority in his presence? More power? Like implied, there isn't ours, the super apostles. Paul's ministry felt weaker than it should because our experience tells us that authority needs to look like force and control and that it should get quick results, right? The more authority someone has, the faster things get done because they can make it happen. The more authority you have, the faster you can make people do what you want them to do. But Paul's response is, I think, very surprising because he says in verse 11, in response to their criticism, I'm going to read it again, let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent We do when present. Paul says, the things that I say to you when I write are the things that you're experiencing from me and receive from me when I arrive. Now, one way to read this is just to hear Paul say, like, hey, I'm not a hypocrite. But the more I thought about this response, the more I realized that this is revealing something much more profound then I do what I say and I say what I do. For our note takers, we're on our second point, by the way. Um, So here's what I did. I, I stopped and I asked, what are the powerful words that Paul's been saying? And this is not a hard question to answer, right? You can read what he wrote in 2 Corinthians, which we've already talked about. You can read what he wrote in 1 Corinthians. You can read what he wrote in all of his other letters. And then it sort of dawned on me as I'm reflecting on this, trying to prayerfully reflect on this. The things Paul writes about are incredibly powerful. And by that, I don't just mean that they impact us emotionally, though they do. I mean there's incredible authority in them. Paul says he writes on behalf of the triune God, right? The one God who exists eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he says that he he writes on their authority about how the second person of the Trinity took on flesh and lived and died to save us. And then he talks about how that God from Jesus has given them authority, Paul, the the apostles, pastors, elders, and deacons, to bring about what Paul calls repeatedly the obedience of faith in the people of God. And what that looks like is not just telling people outside the church, you have a problem that only faith and submission to Jesus will solve, so be reconciled to Jesus. It does include that. But it also looks like telling Christians, this is how you submit your life to Christ and follow him. And that this is not just information. This is not even just an invitation There's commandments in this. And then from there, think about all the things we've been talking about, all the commands that Paul has been giving to the Corinthians in Jesus' name in this letter. Jesus commands the church to forgive and be reconciled to this single individual who has hurt them. He commands the church to love their enemies in real tangible ways and to pray for them. He orders the church to use their money to care for each other and for the poor in the broader church and outside of the church. He requires the church to worship every Sunday, which is so boring, right? It's so boring because we have this guy. Can't he get a joke book or something? I mean, it'd be so much easier if he was funny. Jesus gives all these commands And not just that, Jesus also gave the apostles and the pastors 
and the elders the explicit authority to challenge people when they go astray, which is also part of the letter, right? We hear him call individuals in Jesus' name to repent and change the way we live. We hear him send Timothy and Titus, pastors, to charge their elders to deal with very specific people in the congregation about how they're living and how they're speaking and how they're interacting with people around them. These are the things that Paul's critics call his weighty and strongly written words. And I think Paul agrees. They are weighty and strongly written words. But where Paul disagrees is in how these commands given in Jesus' name by Jesus himself should be delivered and in how people should be treated by those who are calling others to submit themselves to the Lord's word. See, Paul's critics are saying uh, these kinds of commands should come packaged in strength, in intensity, in volume. Because if they're really commands from the king of the universe, from Jesus, they should be inflexible. And we should expect change right now and respect right now. And Paul says, you're wrong. We speak these commands and we call for submission to these commands in the way that our king does. And our king is Jesus. And as Paul says in verse 1, Jesus is meek and gentle. And since these commands come from the king who is meek and gentle, and since Jesus ministers to us right now through his Holy Spirit with meekness and gentleness, our ministry must have the same feeling. And what you are calling weakness is actually meekness and gentleness, and that's intentional because we are trying to minister, to pastor, to shepherd like Jesus himself does. So let me take a second to define meekness and gentleness, and I'll start by saying what these things are not. I think we have in our minds that meekness means weakness, and that gentleness means being a pushover. And because of that, we can understandably be afraid that meekness will simply become a license for people to sin grievously against one another for as long as they want to. And that gentleness precludes any kind of strong stance, even if something is dangerous to other people. But notice in verse 2, Paul says he's expecting to have to take a very strong and forceful stance against the super apostles. And I believe it's chapter 13, Paul will say that he's expecting to come and not spare them this time if he finds them still sinning because they were dangerous to the Christian faith and practice of the Corinthians. So clearly Paul didn't see meekness and gentleness as something that got in the way of protecting other people. But I should say this, Paul's need to take these strong stands was clearly the exception and not the rule. Because if it was the rule, the super apostles couldn't make their critique that Paul is stronger in letter and weaker in person. Normally, most of the time, even in very difficult situations, Paul's ministry was defined by meekness and gentleness. Okay, I told you I would tell you what those words mean. So quickly, meekness. Meekness means patient humility. Patient humility. Meekness treats people in a way that is aware of their limitations and of their frailty. It, it treats people with patience. It recognizes that people don't change on a dime normally, and that change takes time, and that ultimately it takes prayer. Meekness means patient humility. For us, meekness looks like patiently and prayerfully enduring with people while they change or while we wait for them in Jesus' name to begin to change in Jesus' time. So think about Jesus. Jesus lived on earth with his disciples for about three years or so. If you read the Gospels, it seems like many, not all, but many of the problems that the disciples had when they started life with Jesus, they continued to have even after the crucifixion of Jesus. 
Peter is still impetuous. James and John, the sons of thunder, still have anger issues, impatience issues. That's why they're called sons of thunder. And then when Jesus ascends into heaven and lives with them through the Spirit, are the disciples perfect? No. Jesus is still from heaven, meekly, patiently, humbly, ministering to them. For example, throughout Jesus' ministry, he is dealing with the bigotry of the disciples against the Gentiles. And you can see Jesus continuing to work patiently on Peter's bigotry against the Gentiles in the book of Acts for years after he ascends. Jesus calls for perfection, but he doesn't demand instant perfection. Because within our limits as fallen creatures, that kind of change just is not possible. Instead, while he brings us to perfection, while he leads us home to heaven, Jesus patiently and humbly lives with us, growing us by degrees, enduring our frailties, enduring our limitations. I'm going to give you a bonus definition. Humility, as defined by Jesus in Philippians, means looking after the interests of others. And this is why it's important to understand uh, that humility is a part of the definition of meekness. Humility means being aware of what other people need, what their limitations are, and what kind of help they need from us to face those limitations and those needs. That's why humility doesn't look out only for its own interests, but also for the interests of others. And this is why meekness means patient humility. It's being aware of people's limits and then patiently, year after year, working with them within those limits to build them up into the image of Christ. What about gentleness? The word for gentleness, and here I'm stealing the definition that I, uh, from one of my favorite New Testament scholars, Peter O'Brien. He says it means not insisting on every right or matter of law. Gentleness means you overlook slights. It means you don't require that you always get the respect that you deserve and that you cover people's failures with love and with Christian hope. Meaning, Christian hope meaning the knowledge that Jesus is here, he is present, and he is working, and that even this person who makes you so mad is not beyond the working of Christ. In fact, he's probably working there right now, even though you can't see it, because in the Bible, hope means the things you can't see that Jesus is doing that he will reveal in his good time. Who hopes for what he sees, Paul says, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Do you remember the time Peter rebuked Jesus? Right? Jesus is talking about how he's going to go to the cross and die, and then in something that's stunning, something that we probably do when Jesus gives us commands, Peter says, no, Jesus. And then our translation says, far be it from you, a more colloquial expression would be, stop that right now. Peter says to the king of the universe, his rabbi, you stop it, Jesus. Now Jesus replies very strongly, right? He says, get behind me, Satan, the one who's opposing the work of God. So clearly gentleness and meekness can include strongly worded rebukes. But what happens after that? Well, Jesus kicked him out of the disciples, said, never come back, and you're, we're gone now. No, that's not what happened. He takes Peter to a dinner party and sits next to him. He takes him back up to the Mount of Transfiguration and reveals his glory as part of his trusted inner circle. He restores him. Peter rebuked God. Peter rejected a command, but Jesus is gentle. He doesn't insist with rigid inflexibility on getting treated perfectly all the time. And if you look through the Gospels, you can see the gentleness of Jesus, if you understand it this way, everywhere. Jesus is gentle. 
His love covers sins, and it forgives, and it invites Peter and us to walk with him in hope of gospel transformation of the kind that he promised us. And that's why Paul's ministry felt the way it did. He spoke clearly about what Jesus wants, what he calls us to, and then following the commands and practice of his king, he helped the church put them into practice with meekness and gentleness, which looks like pleading, gentle words, repeated visits, lots of prayer, lots of tears, lots of suffering, lots of forgiveness and reconciling and starting over again and again. It, just, it looks like Jesus. And yes, sometimes there was real danger and he had to get up and shut it down, but those moments were very rare. Most of the time it looks like humble, patient, meek, gentle, love. That's what the authority of the church should feel like. Humble patience, gentleness, love calling you to follow Christ, covering your sins, walking with you as we try again. And so from here, let me just end with two more thoughts on this topic. The first is, can the church today, and I'm thinking about the American church here, can it be critiqued like Paul was? Can we be open to the charge that we talk a big game of power, but when it comes to being with people, we're just too nice and gentle and patient for that game to be real? Can people look at the church of Jesus in America and say they claim to have power, but it doesn't look like any kind of power that I recognize? And I don't say do they, I mean can they? Is that charge even possible? Honestly, I think in some congregations it is. But on the whole, and this is me, I think it's not. Maybe you disagree, but if you agree with me, I would invite you to join me in praying for the church in America. Because I'm, I'm going to be honest, generally speaking, I think the church in America today is full of anger and bitterness and impatience, violence, selfishness, hatred, loathing for imperfection and struggle, and is greedy for power of the kind that we see Paul explicitly rejecting. I see it. Maybe you see it. And like me, if you're like me, you go, I can't do anything about it. But we can do one thing. We can pray to Jesus who can. And I would invite you, if you see the same things that I do, to join me in praying that Jesus would gently and meekly transform his churches into places where his gentleness and meekness can be experienced and felt. And then one last thing, because it's not all about what's out there, is grace open to this charge? Are we gentle and meek like Jesus? Am I? Is a session. Now, your elders, I think, are. I think your elders are good, imperfect, but good examples of Jesus' gentleness and meekness. But am I? I want to be. Are we? My friends, let's pray that our ministry would be open to the same kind of charge that Paul's was. And let's pray that God would make whatever changes in us are necessary to make that happen. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for being so meek and gentle with us. Please help us to minister in your name with that same meekness and gentleness. Please help our ministry to feel like the patient humility of Christ as he walks with us into fuller obedience to your word. Please help us to be gentle with one another, to let love cover sin, to work at rebuilding relationships, and to show each other the kindness we daily receive from Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.